God is love. His nature, His law is love. It ever has been. It ever will be. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. For He spake, and it was. He commanded, and it stood fast. He laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. As the earth came forth from the hand of its Maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abounding in terrific steeps and frightful chasms as they now do. The sharp, ragged edges of Earth's rocky framework were buried beneath the fruitful soil, which everywhere produced a luxuriant growth of verdure. There were no loathsome swamps or barren deserts. Graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye at every turn. The heights were crowned with trees more majestic than any that now exist. The air was clear and healthful. The entire landscape outvied in beauty the decorated grounds of the proudest palace. The fruit was just a symbol. The fruit was a test. It was a test of intention, a test of character, a test of faith. Who do I believe? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The beauty that clothes the earth is a token of God's love. We may behold it in the everlasting hills, in the lofty trees, in the opening buds and the delicate flowers. All speak to us of God. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The creation was now complete. The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Eden bloomed on earth. Adam and Eve had free access to the tree of life. No taint of sin or shadow of death marred the fair creation. The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The Almighty God had laid the foundations of the earth. He had dressed the whole world in the garb of beauty and had filled it with things useful to man. He had created all the wonders of the land and of the sea. In six days, the great work of creation had been accomplished.
And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. There are people that say that time is relative. If I look at the scientific thinking in terms of the origin of the universe and the Big Bang, they claim that the universe originally had contracted to the point of the primordial egg, which consisted of, well, as the astrophysicists and the quantum physicists say, literally nothing. So nothing exploded and created everything is the theory of the Big Bang. Now, the Bible says God created out of nothing. He spoke and it stood fast. There is no difference between science and scripture on this level. Both start from nothing and end up with everything. The only difference is the way in which it is perceived over millions and millions of years, or in an instant. Now, if I look at the issue of irreducible complexity on this planet, where certain biological pathways or certain structures, anatomical features, cannot be improved incrementally, but have to be there in their totality before they will work, well, then they would have had to come about instantly. And if that applies, to so many aspects of the biological world, why not to the whole creature as well? I have no problem considering the problems of irreducible complexity to conclude that God spoke and it stood fast. And God rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God looked with satisfaction upon the work of his hands. All was perfect, worthy of its divine author. And he rested, not as one weary, but as well pleased with the fruits of his wisdom and goodness and the manifestations of his glory. After resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it or set it apart as a day of rest for man. Following the example of the Creator, man was to rest upon the sacred day, that as he should look upon the heavens and the earth, he might reflect upon God's great work of creation, and that as he should behold the evidences of God's wisdom and goodness, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his Maker. In Eden, God set up the memorial of his work of creation in placing his blessing upon the seventh day. The Sabbath was committed to Adam, the father and representative of the whole human family. Its observance was to be an act of grateful acknowledgement on the part of all who should dwell upon the earth, that God was their creator and their rightful sovereign, that they were the work of his hands and the subjects of his authority. Thus the institution was wholly commemorative and given to all mankind. There was nothing in it shadowy or of restricted application to any people. God saw that a Sabbath was essential for man, even in paradise. He needed to lay aside his own interests and pursuits for one day of the seven, that he might more fully contemplate the works of God and meditate upon his power and goodness. He needed a Sabbath to remind him more vividly of God and to awaken gratitude because all that he enjoyed and possessed came from the beneficent hand of the Creator. Sabbath shall direct the minds of men to the contemplation of his created works.
By the seventh day, God completed His work which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. The Bible says God rested on the seventh day. Now the seventh day comes after the sixth day when God had completed the physical creation. It is the day immediately subsequent to the creation of all the creatures culminating in the moral creature that he had created, namely man. And the Bible says he rested on the seventh day, and he blessed the seventh day, and he hallowed the seventh day. Now, what does this word hallowed mean? It means to be embodied by the presence of God. So if we share in the Sabbath day, then it means that we share in the very presence of God. That is a personal communication. Now, this word rest, what does it entail? This word rest embodies the, the elements of breathing. And in fact, it's used in that context sometimes in the Old Testament to, to breathe to take a breath of appreciation, to say, wonderful, beautiful, magnificent, to rest in its completion. It's like, like coming home after a very tiring experience and just finding rest or seeing that one that you have missed for a long time and just embracing the person that you love and finding rest in that presence. That's what the Sabbath is about. So the Sabbath is not about works. The Sabbath is not about legalism. The Sabbath is about rest. The Sabbath is about communion. The Sabbath is about relationship. The Sabbath is about appreciation. These are the embodiments of the Sabbath. And if you go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, we are told that we must keep the Sabbath because he brought us up out of Egypt. In other words, he released us from the slavery. What slavery? The incapacitating slavery of sin. Sin is a shackle that holds you down. It's a shackle that drags you into degradation instead of ennobling you. And when Christ came to set the captives free, it was his custom to keep the Sabbath. He rebuked the formalism of the Sabbath because Sabbath is about relationship. He walked and he broke the bread with his disciples on that day. He reached out to the sick. He healed the sick. He ennobled the demoniac on those days. It's about relationship. They sat down at his feet in their right mind, says the Bible, and they were willing to serve rather than to receive. This is the ennobling Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is a day which emphasizes salvation by faith through grace. If I keep the first day of the week, I am keeping the dictates of man. This is a day that was introduced by the very system which says you have to be saved through the system and through the sacramental system which is provided by an institution. The Sabbath says you have direct access to God. The Sabbath says you speak directly to God. You are healed from your nature and the consequences of your nature on the Sabbath day. I don't need 
an institutionalized ritualistic process in order to be saved. If I keep the Sabbath, I acknowledge my relationship, my personal, direct relationship with God. But God has a people. God has a family. And when I embrace him, I embrace his body. In other words, I embrace those that likewise have accepted that a relationship is what matters. What is a relationship without love? And the Sabbath is therefore also the embodiment of love. In this garden were trees of every variety, many of them laden with fragrant and delicious fruit. In the midst of the garden stood the tree of life, surpassing in glory all other trees. Its fruit appeared like apples of gold and silver and had the power to perpetuate life. At the very beginning of man's existence, a check was placed upon the desire for self-indulgence the fatal passion that lay at the foundation of Satan's fall. The tree of knowledge, which stood near the tree of life in the midst of the garden, was to be a test of the obedience, faith, and love of our parents. While permitted to eat freely of every other tree, they were forbidden to taste of this on pain of death. They were also to be exposed to the temptations of Satan, but if they endured the trial, they would finally be placed beyond his power to enjoy perpetual favor with God. Thank you.
Whose norms and standards do I subscribe to? Am I here to serve or am I here to receive, to get the best of everything, to get out of life what it can offer? If we look at the history of mankind, who had been the happiest people on this planet? Those that received, 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 received until they ended their lives in overdoses of drugs and alcohol and misery? Or those that give and give and give? Uh, there are two choices that we can make here. We can either choose to be givers or we can choose to be receivers. As I explained before, if you decide to give and everybody else decides to give, then the ratio of receiving to giving far outnumbers our, our wildest dreams. So a planet based on giving is really the best solution. And when Eve chose that to receive this elevated condition, to be higher than what she perceived to be, that's when she made a choice for selfishness. And selfishness is the root cause of all the pain and misery that this planet brings. That's why the Bible says if you break one commandment, you break them all. Because at the root of all the commandments is the issue of selfishness. And the character of the one that was removed from the heavenly realm exudes selfishness. His principal word is one letter, I. I. What principle do you want to espouse in your life? That is the question at the tree. placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. He was a subject of the divine government, and there can be no government without law. God might have created man without the power to transgress his law. He might have withheld the hand of Adam from touching the forbidden fruit. But in that case, man would have been not a free moral agent, but a mere automaton. Without freedom of choice, his obedience would not have been voluntary, but forced. There could have been no development of character. Such a course would have been contrary to God's plan in dealing with the inhabitants of other worlds. It would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being and would have sustained Satan's charge of God's arbitrary rule. Science speaks of a supercontinent called Pangaea, where all the continents as we have them today were together. And then 150 million years ago, according to science, they broke up and separated. 
into the various continents that we have today. The problem with that is that erosional features occur rather rapidly. And uh, if we take the lowest rate of erosion that we find on this planet, then if we calculate back as to how long it would take before the continents erode down to the level of the sea, then we get come to the conclusion that every 10.2 million years, the continents should be eradicated. And so scientists come up with various ideas as to why they are still there. And you have uplifted areas, but then you run into the problem if you have uplift and you are eradicating through erosion the layers on top, why are the youngest layers still there? They should be gone. So there are various problems with these theories. And the other problem is, after all those millions of years, why do the continents still fit? Or was it perhaps a rapid breakup of this supercontinent? And that explains why it still fits. So the question is not, was there a supercontinent? The question is really, how long ago was there a supercontinent? Now, the Bible speaks of a cataclysmic event that struck this planet a universal breakup of the very structure of the foundations of this planet. And that every mountain was brought low and every hill was raised and the waters covered the earth. And there must have been a tremendous cataclysm which broke up this earth and separated the continents into the units that we have today. As the waters receded, so land bridges appeared here and there, and the structures have been changed and modified into what we have today. And why did God do this? Why separate the continents? Well, according to the scripture, it only took about one and a half thousand years before the whole of humanity had turned their back upon God in the antediluvian world. And when it came to the post-flood world, it didn't take long for all humanity to decide to rebel against the command of God. And you have the story of the Tower of Babel and God separated the nations. And he'd already prepared the separation of the continents, so eventually mankind was spread all over the world into different nations, different group groupings, different ethnicities. And by the separation, the constant tension that was created brought about a reliance upon God. So religion was part and parcel of humanity. They needed God to help them in their struggles of life. They needed him for the harvest. They needed him for the enemy. And in this quest for God, there was the capacity to find the true God, the God of love. And that is why God permitted the separation as we have it today. God made man upright. He gave him noble traits of character with no bias toward evil. He endowed him with high intellectual powers and presented before him the strongest possible inducements to be true to his allegiance. Obedience, perfect and perpetual, was the condition of eternal happiness.
There is always a tendency, as it seems, to negate God. If you look at the ancients, when they rejected God and their morality declined, the nation disappeared and was replaced by another. And so you had successive civilizations on this planet. The famous example is always the fall of the Roman Empire. Prosperity and power had brought with it complacency and uh, moral degeneracy. And eventually it ended in feasts of debauchery. And this led to not only a decline of the moral stature of the nation, but eventually a decline of the norms and standards and eventually also of its power because this kind of situation is not a binding situation, but rather a separating situation where factions which argue and bicker and fight over issues start forming. And this leads to the decline of civilization. We are seeing exactly the same thing in the time that we are living in. We've had periods of great prosperity when there were norms and standards which people lived by. But as we sacrifice these norms and standards, we find more and more factions which become bitter in their hatred towards each other. And a nation divided is a nation that will fall. A planet divided is a, is a planet that will fall. And amidst all this chaos, man is still crying out for a solution. And there is a solution. And everybody knows the solution. And if we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. And he has said, I have come not to condemn the world, but to save it. There is a savior. There is a balm in Gilead. We can go in that direction. But unfortunately, most of humanity, it seems, will reject the outstretched arm of the Creator. But thank God, not all. We have a prophetic view of what is going to happen on this planet. Matthew 24. People will say there have always been earthquakes. There have always been famines. There have always been wars. But not on the scale in which we have them now. If you take earthquakes, for example, the very same instruments that have been monitoring earthquakes are monitoring them on a far more frequent level and at a magnitude never imagined before. I mean, earthquakes in recent history, which used to perhaps occur once in a millennium, are occurring one after the other. I mean, who's ever heard of earthquakes 
registering more than nine on the Richter scale. This is unheard of. Tornadoes. The force of the tornadoes that we have today is just mind-boggling. This kind of phenomenon took place once in a while every few hundred years. Now you pack them in a few in a short period of time, wreaking havoc on the face of the earth. These are signs of the times. It, is been, it was predicted that this would happen. And when you see these things happening, well, then the reader must believe famines. Famine is endemic, is epidemic in the world. When it comes to disease, disease is increasing in proportion to the wickedness of this planet. New diseases, such as we cannot even imagine, are coming all over the world. In the past, viruses were largely restricted to the species in which they were operating. So cat's flu was cat's flu, horse flu was horse flu, swine flu was swine flu, bird flu was bird flu. Not today. Today they are transpecific. Not only that variety of animal, but mankind is affected by these diseases. Disease is increasing exponentially. Antibiotic resistance is making our capacity to fight the diseases less and less. So we have a serious problem on this planet. But God predicted these things, and he gave alternatives. And we can choose a better life in the midst of chaos, like Daniel chose to lead a better life in the midst of Babylonian confusion. And it is a matter of choice. We cannot now capitulate to the evil and go with the flow. We now have to make choice to become sons and daughters of God. And that we can only do by embracing the love of God and accepting the salvation offered in His Son. And no matter what the state of the planet, no matter what the chaos on this planet, there is a hope and there is a future. The surroundings of the holy pair was a lesson for all time. That true happiness is found not in the indulgence of pride and luxury, but in communion with God through His created works. If men would give less attention to the artificial and would cultivate greater simplicity, 
they would come far nearer to answering the purpose of God in their creation. Pride and ambition are never satisfied, but those who are truly wise will find substantial and elevating pleasure in the sources of enjoyment that God has placed within the reach of all. This world was wonderfully created. And we can see the remnants of that glory in the flower, in the creatures that roam across this planet. But we also are told that the earth will wear out like a garment and its inhabitants die like flies. And we are witnessing this. We are witnessing a, a world in a state of chaos. The blood and the tears and the harshness of man is absolutely evident no matter where we look. You cannot turn on the news without being horrified by the mentality of humanity today. God has set a time. And there will come a time when this thing called sin will have to be eradicated from the universe. And we have this brief life to make a choice. And God has promised just as we have a brief time to make a choice, so the whole planet has a brief time to make a choice because God will not tolerate sin for all eternity to be a blight in his universe and a blot on his creation. So he has promised that when we see the things that he has said would take place, that these are signs that he would return and end the process. And I'm seeing all of these. And I believe with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my being that the creator of the universe is preparing to take off his priestly garment and to change them for a kingly robe and to return to this earth with power and glory and majesty and to set straight this problem. He will intervene in human affairs. He will come again the second time and he will come and fetch his redeem and those that have made the decision to be ennobled by his grace. And unfortunately, those who cling to sin will have to suffer the consequences because to sin he is a consuming fire. If you cling to sin, then unfortunately you will be destroyed together with that sin. So make a choice. Make a choice. You have nothing to lose. Make a choice to choose the path of righteousness and to grab hold of the only hand that can save you. And he is coming soon. To restore the world and to restore our characters to a world beautifully created. The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose ways are everlasting, changeth not. With him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning.
I'm sometimes asked, how do I feel personally about these issues? I have a scientific mind, and a scientific mind reasons from cause to effect. And uh, I know that this word love has many, many connotations and has many emotions attached to them. And it's good to experience such emotions. And I do have moments of this euphoric appreciation and love. But the essence of love is a principle. Love is a principle which cannot be moved though the heavens fall. Therefore God, who is the epitome of love, is a God of principle. And what I appreciate about God is that he would stoop down to the level where I was, a carnal level that totally rejected everything about God, that he would stoop down and take this hand and lift it up out of the degradation and put him on a platform together with angelic beings? That to me is mind-boggling. And when I see the little details of how he works in your daily life, the little things that go unnoticed, that you see in a look of kindness, that you see in a little act of kindness, and you know that every act of kindness ever to take place on this planet is inspired by the Spirit of God, then your appreciation for him can only grow. I cannot wait to see the face of God. God is love. His nature, His law is love. It ever has been. It ever will be. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The beauty that clothes the earth is a token of God's love. We may behold it in the everlasting hills, in the lofty trees, in the opening buds and the delicate flowers. All speak to us of God. On every leaf of the forest or stone of the mountains, in every shining star, in earth and air and sky, God's name was written.